the march of time. Out this week is a special 300-page issue of the Architectural Forum, packed with a thousand and one practical new suggestions for making your home more livable. Suggestions that you will find invaluable if you're planning to build or remodel a house, to make over your apartment, or even to plan better closets for your home. In this special issue, the Architectural Forum shows you how to get more space for less money, how to make small rooms seem larger, how to double the usefulness of closets, how to make practical and economical use of built-in furniture and equipment, how to pick wisely from the new lighting fixtures, floor and wall coverings and furnishings, these ideas are explained by 201 case studies and 400 photographs, plans, and working drawings. Each detail is nailed down for practical reference with manufacturers' names, stock numbers, and retail prices. And almost every idea shown in the issue can be applied economically to even the smallest house. The Architectural Forum is published by the publishers of Time and Life and Fortune. It is the outstanding magazine in the architectural and building field. Before you build or remodel or redecorate your house or apartment, Ask your architect and builder to let you study his copy of the October Architectural Forum. Or while the supply lasts, send one dollar to Time Incorporated, Chicago, Illinois, and ask for your own copy of the Architectural Forum's big October issue. Tonight, the editors of Life join the editors of Time in presenting by radio the reenactment of memorable scenes from the news of the week from the March of Time. <laughs> This week on the stage of Boston's Colonial Theater opens a new musical comedy, I'd Rather Be Right, by playwrights George S. of the Icing Kaufman and Moss Hart. Music and lyrics by Richard Rogers and Lorenz Hart. Out on the stage set of Central Park, wearing the Roosevelt top hat, the Roosevelt cutaway, Roosevelt pinch glasses, the Roosevelt smile, comes famed U.S. song and dance man George M. Cohan as the President of the United States. Bluebird, you're going to sing. Swing out church bells, you're going to ring. Take aim, Cupid, you're gonna go bing. We're going to balance the budget. Cheer up, farmer, you'll buy a new car. Wake up, landlord, and open the bar. Come out, rainbow, wherever you are. We're going to balance the budget. Ta -ta -ra. Hear the horn of plenty blow. Ta -ta -ra. The dollar bills will flow. Yankee Doodle, we're letting you know. We're going to balance the budget. So begins the week for Franks and Roosevelt with the mildly disconcerting news from Boston that during the coming theatrical season he is to be the subject of a political satire and the first living U.S. president to be the hero of musical comedy. Then this week to Franklin Roosevelt comes news of a more serious nature. Monday morning, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Buyers and sellers cluster around trading posts as trading opens at 10 a.m. <laughs> Steel, 66 and a half off two. Allied Chemical, 170 off three and a quarter. Bethlehem Steel, 55 and a half. Prices at one o'clock. General Motors off one. Montgomery Ward off three. U.S. Steel, 62. Closing prices. Stocks off two to 15 points. Bonds also break. And a Copper off one. Oh, other shares downward in the worst decline in six years, with selling orders and a thousand issues swapping the exchange. That night to the nation, Franklin D. Roosevelt issues two statements. The president on the current budget. That the net fiscal deficit will be $695 million, an upward revision of $277 million, due to increased congressional spending, reduced internal revenue expectations. The president on economics and economies. That prosperity has returned to the U.S., that the economic situation therefore requires, and the nation expects, drastic curtailment of expenditures on WPA and relief by the federal government.
But Tuesday over the market tickers. AT&T off nine. American chain and cable preferred off 62 and three quarters. Shares traded first hour, 2,210,000. Largest in the market. Shares are thrown on the floor in blocks of 5,000, 25,000. The ticker lags 22 minutes behind trading. Margin accounts are wiped out. An exchange seat sells for $61,000, an 18-year low. Over 1,000 issues are traded. The broadest market in exchange history. And Wall Street spirits, the lowest since 1929. Declares Chase National Bank Board Chairman Winthrop Aldrich. The break in stock market prices, which began in mid-August, must be attributed to the variety of restrictions placed upon financial circles by the present administration. Charges Illinois Congressman A.J. Sabbath. Reports from Washington clearly indicate that the stock market slump is directly traceable to a Wall Street conspiracy to discredit the Roosevelt administration. Proclaims Kansas Alfred Mossman Landon. The real reason why progress lags in America today is the failure of the President of the United States to follow our constitutional method of government and his failure as an administrator. Financial, political, and theatrical focus of the week is Franklin D. Roosevelt. And although market shares recover, confounding Republican critics and New Deal defenders alike, U.S. investors have had their most hectic week in many a month. Wall Street, its worst scare since 1929. But at week's end, last word still lies with Franklin Roosevelt who warns financial circles to expect no lessening of federal regulation, to be prepared for more. Time marches on. Tampa, Florida. The night of November 30th, 1935. Before the death sergeant and city hall police station stand three arrested men. They are Eugene F. Pullnott, Dr. Samuel Rogers, and Joseph Shoemaker. But, officer, why were we arrested? What's the charge against us? We're letting you off this time. You can go now, all of you. Well, what are you waiting for? Well, my papers. I'd like to get them back if I can. Listen, Shoemaker. Oh, I, I don't care about most of it, but there's a kind of personal notebook there and a letter. Letter? The one on top there. Just a personal letter. Hmm. Most interested in conditions you describe in your section of the country. You and I are in fundamental accord on the principles you outline. Franklin D. Roosevelt? Say, what's this, a forgery? Well, you see, I wrote to President Roosevelt. Oh, all right. All right, take the letter. Here's the notebook. Now, you three guys, get out of here. Beat it. Come on. Hey, Shoemaker. Yes? I want to talk to you. Who are you? Never mind who. Come on. You're going along with us. Thirty minutes later, in a wooded section 14 miles from Tampa Police Headquarters. What are you going to do? Cover his mouth, boys. This will teach the dirty red to meddle in Tampa politics. What, what, what are you trying to do to me? Rip his clothes off. Yeah. Come, Come on. on. Uh, Put your face in the dust. That'll shut him up. Okay, let him have it right. So you don't like the trance, you make it? Bring it in all the agitators to clean up our town. Wrote to the president, you heard? Told him a pack of lies about law and order down here. Report of the coroner's office. Joseph Shoemaker. Right side of skull crushed. Wounds and mutilations of flesh aggravated by gasoline and hot tar. Gangrene of right leg. Death after amputation. Voidic. Death of complications resulting from accidental or purposely inflicted wounds. Such is the inception of the now famed Tampa flogging case. A twisted and violent drama of hatred, terrorism, and corruption in a southern town. Brought to trial are five members of the Tampa police force. 
Found mysteriously dead are the two chief witnesses against the defendants. Found guilty of kidnapping Joseph Shoemaker and his companions are five Tampa police officers. Are promptly released on a technicality by the Florida State Supreme Court. Then, this week of 1937, in the court of Tampa trial judge John F. Duell. I saw Officer Bridges holding a man on the floor of a car outside City Hall Police Station the night of November 30th. He had his foot on the man's neck. Did you know who the man was? It was Joe Shoemaker. And when he saw me, he yelled for help, and Bridges hit him over the head with a pistol butt to shut him up. Just a moment there. Yes, Your Honor? The court can't accept this testimony, Mr. Farrell. The indictment says injury to body and limb. The witness introduces testimony that the deceased was hit over the head with a pistol butt. Your Honor, I... The head is not a part of the body. But, Your Honor... The court orders the defendants released because of insufficient evidence against them. This week, as a bewildered jury finds the defendants not guilty, legally forever closed is the famed Tampa flogging case. And this week, written into the court records of the state of Florida are the text of two documents removed from the torn and bloody clothing of murdered Joseph Shoemaker. The first, a letter from Franklin D. Roosevelt. The second, a page torn from a notebook. Happy is that people, and proud they may be, who can perfect their political forms without bloodshed or threat of violence. The long debate of reason resulting in the glad consent of all. Time marches on. Southward across the Siberian steppes before the inexorable advance of a glacier are the ancient animals of the Pleistocene era. Giant wolves, saber toothed tigers, short haired bison, brown slope, shaggy two hunted camels, horses no larger than a lapdog. And following the smaller animals over the soft brown swell of the Arctic summer is a huge hairy coated mammoth. The great prehistoric elephant of the Siberian plains. Skirting the glacier in search of the herbs and grasses, which are his sustenance. Trudging over the sticky, half-frozen surface of the glacial drift, the giant, clumsy creature plods toward a field of alpine poppies a few yards down the soft, muddy slope. It moves more ponderously as the tons of his weight push the short, shaggy elephant legs deeper into the bog. Struggles a few yards further, a trunk extended just short of a yellow poppy. Heaves four legs free, drags his great shaggy carcass another yard. Another foot closer, extends his trunk, and seizes the first bright flower. Then, trapped, unable to move, the giant creature sinks deeper into the morass. Trumpets a last scream of anguish, and disappears beneath a crackling, expanding mass of half-frozen slime. on Wrangell Island, 100 miles off the coast of northern Siberia. The Arctic swell pushes up drifts of freezing topsoil, opens fissures, pushes pre-glacial boulders to the surface. And lying in a ravine as if fresh killed by a Stone Age hunter, two Russian scientists find a mammoth which died 20,000 years ago. Its flesh and fur perfectly preserved by natural refrigeration. The ivory of its long, curving tusks as lustrous as porcelain. In its mouth, with a fresh, unmasticated morsel of prehistoric herbs and grass, a single bright yellow alpine poppy. Time marches on. <laughs> Stacked on the waterfront are some hundred massive boxes, eight feet square. Under the eyes of armed Nazi officers on the bridge, members of a German crew load the 1,300-ton freighter Gauss. 
swaying it straight from the dock and through the open hatches as other steamers store the cargo away in the hold. Another one. What kind of cargo is this, anyway? Yeah, nobody seems to know, except the officers. Yeah. Biggest crates I ever saw. Might be iron ore. No, not heavy enough. I'd say lemons, but I never saw fruit crates like this. No. Hey, look, Max. We'll see what's inside. Our boards work loose. Yeah, rip it off. It won't hurt. Yeah. Yeah, what are you doing there? Nothing, sir. We only wondered what's in all the boxes. That's no concern of yours. Stow these boxes away. Then get out of the hole and stay out. hundred crates stacked high in the Gauss's hold under battened hatches as the little German freighter sails north for Bremen, Germany that afternoon. On deck, a group of seamen stands watching the wheeling flight of two large birds above the ship's masthead. Been following us ever since we left shore, that pair. Look at him. I think he's going to light. Yeah, you're right. It's perched up there on the yard. Uh, a big bird. What is it? I say if the mate knows. Hey, officer, what kind of bird is that up there? Bird? Bird? Get to work. Back to your work, all of you. Don't you know what they call those birds? No. What is it? Oh. It's a vulture. That's what it is. A black vulture. Entering the English Channel, the ship's doctor visits the captain's cabin. But it's getting worse, Captain. Worse every day. Yes, yes, but even so, Doctor, it does no good to talk about it. The crew is already complaining, sir. And no wonder. It's even up here. We need ice. It is impossible, Doctor. We are in a hurry to reach Bremen. A great hurry. Then I won't be responsible any longer. Either for the health of the crew or what happens in the hold to the cargo itself. At last, the Black Hull's Gauss makes the port of Bremen, ties up to her dock, and long shoremen come aboard to unload her. All right, sir, we'll take over. Good. All right. Swing it this way. Yeah, a little more. All right, sir. All right, that's it. Lift the hatches. All ready? Yeah. That? Wait a minute. Uh, I won't go down in that hole. Neither will I. I don't want this job. Not for What's the matter here? Down in the hole, all of you. Be quick about it. Not down in that hole, sir. I was in the war. Lots of us were. And we all know what that smell means. Yeah. The smell? You should be proud to carry them from the ship. They died in the service of the fatherland. This week, for the first time since its foundation... The 27 Nation Non Intervention Committee reaches an agreement on the withdrawal of foreign volunteers from Spain. This week, the Loyalist port of Hejon falls after six months of siege before insurgent troops and their German and Italian allies. But this week, withdrawn in secret, 700 German soldiers, crated six coffins to a box, are brought back to German soil for burial. Time marches on. <laughs> Massachusetts. This week, through the open bedroom window of sleeping citizen John Cronin, climbs a shadowy figure. Tiptoes quietly past a sleeping form in the bed, opens a bureau drawer. Hi. How are you? What's that? Who's there? Put up your hands. I'm a burglar. Huh? I said put up your hands. Well, stop shining that light in my face. Be more quiet. I'm a sick man. Oh. Uh. Well, I'm sorry you're sick, Chief. Uh, didn't mean to... Oh, that's all right. Nobody pays any attention to a sick man. 
Well, uh, what's the matter? Stomach trouble. And sinus. That's what's really bad. Sinus. Oh, yeah, I know. In your forehead, huh? My sister had that. You know what they used to do for her? Massage. No good. I've tried that. I've tried everything. Now, listen, if the massage is right, I'm telling you, it'll fix it. Here, where's that light switch? Oh, it's up there. Okay. Now, what side's the paint on? It's right here. All right. Hey, what are you doing? Massage, I told you. Now, the neck. This relaxes the muscles. Oh. What's that supposed to do? That's for the nerves. Relaxation. That's what you need. Now... I'll get these back muscles. Mm -hmm. Damn. Feel better, Chief? Uh huh. Well, maybe I'll get to sleep now. Hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. How about the dough? Where do you keep it? Oh, uh, I think there's a few dollars in the drawer over there. Uh, thanks, Chief. Is this all you got? Uh huh. Well, good night, Chief. Good night. Hey. Yeah. Didn't I tell you I'm a sick man? Close that window. This week, arrested on charges of rifling homes in and about Waltham, Massachusetts, is one Robert Ulrich, 25. But asked to identify sympathetic burglar Ulrich, says sinus victim John Cronin. I don't know if that's him or not. Anyway, he only got $3. The massage would have cost me 5 1937... Marches on. Rennes Cathedral in the province of Marne, northeastern France. It is the night of September 14th, 1914. In the great nave of the Rennes Cathedral, now being used as an emergency hospital, Nurses move among the long rows of wounded men lying on the straw-covered stone as a new German counterattack begins. Here is some water for you. Oh, thank you. Let me hold up this here. Nurse. Nurse. Yes, Dr. LeMay. We've got to evacuate these men from the cathedral. It's too big a target for those shells. Stretch of crews are coming here now. Ambulances outside. Hurry and tell the other nurses. Yes, Dr. Orderly. Yes, Stretch of crews will begin with this war and work on down. Be careful, but hurry. Yes, Doctor. Stretcher. Take this man. Yes, sir. Next. Stretcher. Hurry up. Stretcher. In the reign of Philip Augustus, ground was first broken in the town of Rennes for men inspired with a strange and yearning to convey to future generations in towering spires and vaulting arches their vision of the glory of God. For half a millennium after its completion, the history of the Rennes Cathedral is the history of France. Before its richly carved altar, 36 kings were crowned. In the stained light of its matchless rose window knelt Anne of Austria, caught in the intrigues of the wily Richelieu. Here, Charles VII received the crown. At his side, the peasant girl who made his coronation possible, Joan of Arc. Past its doors went Louis XVI on his futile flight from Paris. And a quarter of a century later, Napoleon to the battlefield of Waterloo. And in the early days of the World War, blue-clad soldiers singly or in little groups, steal into the dim, hushed interior of the cathedral for a moment's brief devotion on their way up to the front. Then, on that fateful night of September 1914... A shell crashes through the flying buttresses of the arch roof, explodes inside... Another smashes the rose window, cunningly contrived by Bernard de Soissons in the 13th century. The pulpit designed by Blondel of Rennes splinters into fragments. 
the straw where the wounded lie catches fire. The flames shoot upward. Six the figures of the wooden saints carved five centuries before by sculptors whose names have long since been forgotten. Mount to the vaulted roof, roaring skyward around the towers. The rafters that support the great bell that for centuries have thundered the solemn summons to prayer blaze up, begin to sag with their heavy weight of iron, suddenly collapse. Terribilis est locus iste, hic domus dei est et porta celi, et vocabitur aula dei. This week of 1937, a procession of 600 priests and dignitaries of the Catholic Church, headed by the Archbishop of Reims, circles the cathedral three times, sprinkling holy water upon the newly restored walls, celebrating the completion of the 20 years' work of reconstruction. The procession reaches the great carved door. The archbishop steps forward, knocks upon the closed door with his crozier. Apolite portas principes, vestras et elevamine. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, O ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Slowly the ponderous doors swing open, and the procession enters. consecrated to the service of God. Time marches on. Another eventful week of the fascinating, stranger than fiction news pageant, which millions of American families now follow from week to week in the pages of Life, the magazine of pictures. Since September 1st, one quarter of a million more people have been able to buy Life on U.S. newsstands. Thousands of additional copies are going to news dealers every week, but they still have far from enough to take care of all their customers. So if you don't see Life on your favorite newsstand, ask your news dealer for it. The new issue of Life is on sale tomorrow morning. In this big 140-page issue, you will find stories from the week's news front. Most noteworthy figure encountered by President Roosevelt on his Northwestern tour, life reveals this week, is Seattle's boss, Dave Beck. A picture study of two-fisted, beefy, gimlet-eyed teamster Beck, unofficial ruler of Seattle, one of the potential masters of U.S. labor. In the theater, actor George M. Cohan mimics Franklin D. Roosevelt. From the new play, I'd Rather Be Right. Life's photographers catch the most impudent and hilarious scenes. Science and industry. On the eve of New York City's automobile show, Life presents a photographic biography of Charles Franklin Kettering. The self-termed dumbest kid in school. The crackpot inventor who, beginning with a self-starter, has had his fingers in nearly every important practical automobile development. Today, he is trying to harness the sun's energy. What's to become of the greatest child star of them all, Shirley Temple, now that she is growing up? Life's movie of the week, Heidi answers the question. Propaganda. Life brings together propaganda pictures from both sides of the Spanish Civil War. Pictures whose drama, whose terror, whose pathos, whose sex appeal, whose fakery are designed to enlist for one side or the other support and sympathy from U.S. citizens. These are but five of the 60 stories in pictures with which life covers the world this week in its new issue. The new issue is on sale at newsstands tomorrow. And news dealers now have another quarter of a million extra copies. If you don't see life on your favorite newsstand, we suggest you ask for it. Marches on. (laughs) 
Again next Thursday night at the same hour, The March of Time. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thank <laughs> you.